Okay, very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for taking time this morning to attend the webinar series, Health and Wealth During COVID-19, two of the most discussed topics since the onset of the pandemic. My name is Jason, representing Singapore Business Group, and I am your host for today. Taking this chance to also thank nine of our co-hosting chambers in Vietnam, Australian Chamber of Commerce, British Business Group, the Council of Taiwanese Chambers of Commerce, Hong Kong Business Association, Italian Chamber of Commerce, Indian Business Chamber, Malaysia Business Chamber, the Singapore, the Bis Thai Business Association, and Singapore Business Association. It is also a tradition of Singapore Business Group to have a lucky draw at the end of the webinar. So be sure you stay until the very end. <coughs> Now, some housekeeping rules to remind our webinar attendees. But remember to put your microphones on mute when not speaking. We will observe the question and answer session at the end of the presentation by our experts. You are encouraged to use the chat function right, to post your questions throughout the webinar. In the essence of time, we may not be able to cover all questions during the webinar, but we will get back to you separately after the event through email. Now, providing you with some backdrop, COVID-19 has sickened more than 4.9 million people worldwide and killed at least 300,000 people. It has now affected at least 177 countries across the globe. According to the World Economic Forum, the pandemic will cost the world approximately $1 trillion US dollar due to economic slowdown. Global GDP growth perspective on the downside projection, we may return to the growth level during the dot-com crash in 2001. This is going to affect the way we live, the way we play, and the way we plan our wealth. So in helping us navigate through uncharted waters, we are very honored to have both wealth and health experts with us today. So first in the pipeline, we have Mr. Abel Lim. Mr. Abel Lim is Executive Director and Head of Wealth Management Advisory and Strategy in UOB. Abel is a veteran with more than 20 years of experience in advisory business. So he leads a team of portfolio strategists to oversee the portfolio investment, strategic direction of the bank's personal financial services segment. Abel also spearhead and plays a pivotal role at the UOB Privileged Banking Forum as a speaker moderator and host. He has represented the bank in many external speaking engagements on investment advisory matters. So over to you, Abel. Thank you very much, Jason. Good morning to everyone. Uh, my name is Abel and hello from Singapore. Um, it's a huge honor and thank you very much for this invite. And I will attempt to provide some perspective of the current market that we are in today, um, how we see the economic rebound, the impact on the financial markets, um, and also how COVID is affecting certain sectors that we'll be discussing, and what you as an investor should be thinking about. We are really in exceptional times. The last time borders were closed, businesses were forced to shut, and everyone was literally forced to stay home was during the World War II. Um, this is definitely unprecedented and we are facing a new um, invincible enemy today, an enemy that is so potent in its spread and pace of how it is infected not only the human population but also the financial markets. Markets has fallen at an unprecedented pace. I mean, if you think about it, um, within a very short of nine weeks, all jobs created since 2008, the financial crisis has been totally wiped out and then some. If you look at the US unemployment, uh, particularly in the U6 uh, line, unemployment has actually reached 22.8. U6 in in includes um, the discouraged uh, workers and also people who are unable to nail down a permanent job. So that number currently stands at 22.8% far from the Great Depression lows of or Great Depression highs of 
some experts in the industry are expecting this number to top out at 35%, which means we are looking at a very long drawn, very painful economic downturn. Um, similarly, capital reversal from emerging markets, which took nearly one year during the financial crisis, took only slightly one month for it to totally reverse, which resulted in a dollar grab. So as the earlier image showed, we are still in bear territory. The bear is still um, in the driver's seat and really not out of the woods yet. But let me put, put, provide some backdrop on where we really are today. We are really in a collection of crises. It's not just a COVID-19, although it is the origin of, of where and all started. But we're in a health and medical crisis. The speed on uh, how fast COVID-19 has spread from the rest of the world, the devastation and how countries were caught off guard has actually showed up some significant weakness, both on industry and on a government standpoint. We are also in a oil or energy crisis. Russia and OPEC clearly chose the absolute worst time to have a price war, resulting in oil to be worth practically nothing during the May contracts. Uh, I'll come to that slightly later because this is also one of the sectors that we'll be discussing. It also became a financial crisis. Memories of the 2008 global financial crisis came very swiftly as companies and investors started for a dollar grab um, credit and liquidity started to freeze up yet again, and that caused tremendous panic in the financial markets for sure. Fortunately, this time around, um, central banks around the world well scooped after the financial crisis stepped in very quickly. In fact, uh, this time we actually saw central banks coming to the aid of the market way before the market actually collapsed. Um, this is good. Um, it does provide a backdrop to or backstop to how far the market is or companies are likely to slide. Um, it prevented mass bankruptcy and unfortunately it did not really prevent mass unemployment. It is now very quickly evolving into an economic crisis. Um, and this crisis is unique, unique in the sense that it is both a demand and a supply shock. Uh, think about this, John Doe wants to go to buy um, a drill, for example. Um, where he can go to a shop because A, he's un, uh, unemployed now or it's going to be unemployed. B, the shops are closed and the shops cannot go to the manufacturer to buy because the drill is no, not available because the company is not open, the manufacturers are not open and the manufacturers cannot go to the raw material providers because the mines are not open as well. But that's on the demand side. Reverse the cost on the supply side. There's no workers at the mine. So there's no raw materials being produced. Manufacturing companies cannot lay their hands on raw materials. And as a result, they are unable to produce any tools for John Doe to buy. And John Doe is unemployed. So as you can see, this is a dual or rather double-edged sword, which um, it's very, very hard to navigate around. This problem is even further compounded by the fact that um, most developed nations, um, including the United States, 80% of the GDP is through consumers. And if you take that group of consumers out of the equation, that's going to have a massive impact, a detrimental impact on the country's GDP. Secondly, supply chains are not that easily resol resolved and resol uh, restored. You see, while economies continue their ways of um, unlocking and going back to work and hopefully getting their, 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 their manufacturing up, the virus is not synchronized in any way shape or form in fact the virus is affecting different countries at different pace and different countries are, are experiencing different levels of of um, recovery as take for example china china has uh, um, opened up um, getting the people back into the workforce and they're prepared to crank up the manufacturing machine but who are they selling to global demand has disappeared um, the global bias has been desecrated and there's really no audience. On the recovery front, I mean, many of you have already heard or about this V, a U, a L, or even a W recovery. I will definitely circle back to that later in, my, in a later slide. But let's talk very quickly about COVID-19. This current crisis is, um, is a unique trigger 
unlike um, the excesses of the past where there was imbalances or bubbles in the financial markets, this crisis is actually a trigger event. Um, it's an exogenous um, event of which I, I believe the uniqueness requires also a very unique solution and also um, different measures to, to, to be able to deal with. Um, clearly, many experts out there, and I'm, perhaps I will defer to Doctor later on the ability or the the probability of a vaccine being made available come the next twelve of eighteen months. Of course, the other potential that we will be looking or already tracking is clearly the containment efforts around the world. How countries are able to manage or to bring down that curve. But I assure you, one thing is for sure: the damage to global economies is going to be big. Last but not least, will the virus just simply disappear like SARS? Or so a lot of this are uh, definitely in consideration and definitely we will need to pay very close attention to. In UB, we've identified three possible um, Clearly, the first one is a V-shaped recovery. Like I said, all the, um, scenarios that we are pl planning up right now will have tremendous impact on the economies. Um, I think what differs is the depth and also the breadth of the, the impact and how permanent it will be. In a V-shaped recovery, clearly we want to see containment happening, um, preferably by the first half of this year, if it's possible. Um, we don't think this likely as such the probability and all the odds of this happening has actually receded tremendously. On the fixed income space, uh, we expect better liquidity. We expect spreads, uh, spreads to be tightening uh, in the later part of uh, Q3 as well, uh, which means that fixed income will become an interesting investment going forward. Um, on the FX space, uh, commodities and energy reliant currencies like the Aussie is likely to experience a rebound. But again, that is not our base case scenario. Our base case scenario is really a huge of which we have um, assigned a 55% probability on such a uh, recovery. Clearly, we are expecting a quarter four containment that the virus is brought under control. We will be experiencing technical recession for the first half of this year and a gradual, um, by that I would like to hasten to add, a volatile and rather painful recovery towards the end of 2020. Equities is likely to bottom out late part of second half and that or go back to a bull run again. Fixed income spreads are likely to remain wide. Uh, we think that liquid is likely to recover again towards the later part of 2020. And then um, we should be looking at a potential bond rally uh, post crisis, dependent, however, of course, on the low interest rates. On the FX front, dollar crunch is likely to recede, and we expect Asian currency, particularly the Chinese yen, to stage a significant rebound. Now, the L-shape recovery, the dreaded L-shape, um, this means that the virus is not contained to perhaps the later part of 2021 next year. We expect a deep recession, or this will lead to a very deep recession, uh, significant financial stress across the around the world. And hopefully, uh, when that happens, we'll finally see a recovery. On the equity space, huge sell-offs as business starts to close, um, companies goes into bankruptcy and unemployment spikes significantly. Um, and the recovery, again, will be very painful, highly volatile, and will probably take the next two years to actually get back to where we originally were. On the fixed income space, clearly, um, the financial stress is likely to continue for fixed income or bonds uh, with very little upside and spreads to stay very, very wide. Clearly, US dollar is going to be a winner in this space, being a safe currency. I think we also look towards gold as a potential investment um, decision. Some of you, have, you might have actually heard of um, a, dub, uh, a W um, scenario being played out. Well, typically, that is really a double dip recession. And this is usually a result of policy missteps. And we saw that during the Great Depression in when the Federal Reserve started to spike or hike rates a little bit too early, causing the economy to slump yet again to a second recession in very close proximity. And that resulted in a W recession. 
there are some things that um, well we know that the markets has recovered quite nicely in in, in recent um, weeks, but there are certain things that we need to be aware of: expectations and reality. In this chart, you're looking at the S and P five hundred um, numbers. The uh, black dotted line is a twelve month PE. Um, typically, it, it it's it's the it is used as guidance for what investors need to pay for an equity for every dollar the the future dollar that the company is expected to earn. Now, on the bottom, the red line is a long term EPS growth. This is a analyst expectation of what S and P is likely to deliver in terms of uh, earnings growth over a five or maybe a three time frame. As you can see, there's a huge disparity between what the market is expecting and what reality is showing. And this can be a very painful lesson because history, if anything, has shown us that every time there's a huge disparity between market expectations and where the actual earnings growth is, is likely to be, you will see that the uh, market expectations are usually proven wrong and there is a deep and very sharp correction depth. Today, I would say that we are in clearly in very extreme uh, overvaluation scenario, meaning markets are expecting a significant recovery, uh, getting back to 2019 highs, um, and expecting that the virus will just simply disappear. Whereas the real economy, the red line, is showing that earnings is likely to be impacted tremendously and the future for earnings going forward may not be as rosy as what market participants are expecting. Now let's very quickly consider some of the impacts of on, on some of the uh, major industries that, that we are looking at. Clearly, it's not an exhaustive list. There's a lot of other industries that uh, we, we have not touched upon. On one hand, um, on the left side, under the higher part of the scale, we see technology and we like technology. And I will throw, and I will throw um, AI and innovation into this equation as well. Um, this crisis has actually forced many people to embrace technology a lot more um, than they expected. Well, literally, they have no choice. Um, take for example this webinar. I would love to fly to Vietnam to engage all of you face to face and have this conversation. But unfortunately, uh, it's not possible right now because Singapore, we are experiencing a circuit breaker or a, a, a form of lockdown, if you if you will. So we are embracing technology in in a in a very huge and uh, manner. Similarly, for average Joe, the simple order uh, ordering of food, F and B, and groceries that has changed. People who were formerly afraid of using apps to order um, the basic necessities uh, for fear of privacy, for fear of um, uh, credit card fraud, has now no choice but to actually use it. And then suddenly they realize that they do actually have an other option and a very viable option even when COVID-19 has uh, eventually ended. So having said that, we are clearly um, in a space where innovation has not slowed down, but instead it has picked up tremendously or rather the need of innovation and, 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 and um, disruption has picked up tremendously. And there's likely to be more options, even better options going forward, which we will be looking and hopefully embracing in the near future. The next um, is healthcare. Well, healthcare, not just because of the crisis. Yes, of course, this is incredibly important right now. And, and kudos to all our frontliners who are risking their life to fight this virus. But this is not just about the healthcare. Uh, it's actually a structural change. The world is aging. Uh, aging and is aging very, very quickly. Um, and on the side of coin, people are living a lot longer. So you have a double whammy in, in this front. Take China, for example. Over 380 million Chinese will be age 65 and above come 2030. And that's just only two decades from, uh, one decade from now. That, this, this is like the entire US population and then some being over 65 in retirement Seeking medical help, requiring medical uh, assistance, and clearly for um, requiring medical uh, attention as well. So that is a huge market that we are looking at, and this will not go away. And this is one of the few global structural changes that cannot be uh, changed in the near term. 
last but not least, we like consumption uh, story. Uh, we like the consumer staple story, rather. Basic necessities and needs. But given this current crisis, basic needs and necessities has not changed. I mean, if, if you think about it, um, people are not shying away from toothpaste and shampoos and 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 and, and toothbrush uh, in fact there was a huge grab for, for toilet rolls which is a phenomenon which i can't, can't understand maybe doctor can ex uh, seek to explain that for me later um, but really there, there are things that people cannot do without however but because of the current situation in the employment front people may opt for cheaper options um, as such smaller um, producers may be squeezed out and we expect some MMA um, procedures going forward as bigger players start to sell out the smaller ones. Now, on the other side of the scale, we have hospitality. Um, and I would throw in travel and industry into this as well. We're facing massive disruption and, and disruption in, in, in this front. Um, some experts are claiming that it will take at least 24 to 36 months before this industry is likely to recover. And I agree because COVID-19 will change how travel is, is, is uh, being thought of and how travel is being consumed. Uh, for example, as companies have invested tremendous amount of technology, they may find that they don't need to travel as much or at least they can uh, apportion some of their efforts or energy towards uh, non-travel essentials. As such, companies and countries that are highly reliant on, on, on travels, on hospitalities and the airlines, is likely to fare very poorly in the next two years. But clearly the travel bug will be dead once the industry is reopened and things get back to some form of normality. I'm pretty sure that travels will start again and people will start to um, demand more um, travel experiences. Energy, as I spoken earlier, um, I think as global demand and supply grinds to a halt as we experience right now, it has got a tremendous negative impact on both energy prices and energy producing companies. As airlines or airplanes don't fly, ships are not sailing, trucks are not moving around the nation, delivering the demand for energy is likely to face significant headwinds going forward. In fact, we think that $40 per barrel for brand oil is likely to be a significant ceiling for at least in the near future. At least unfortunately, it's financials. Um, with extremely low interest rates going forward and for a lot, we think that the net interest margin for banks is likely to be crippled. We think that at this current juncture, uh, given the current market environment, uh, the fee income is likely also to be uh, badly affected considering the fact that people are not investing nor borrowing. Um, and because of the current market environment, non-performing loans is likely to due to the deterioration of asset qualities. So these are some of the um, industries happy to, to, to talk about others um, in the Q&A later, but these are some of the industries that we think is likely to face quite a significant headwind going forward. So in the interest of time, um, let us focus on some of the um, key risks that uh, I think we as an investor or global market participants should be aware of. Clearly, there's a lot of concern about the potential secondary and tertiary waves around the world. Um, some of it has already surfaced in both um, Korea and China, and, and that has sent ripples in the financial markets, and people are concerned of what uh, potentially um, could um, result in a second wave or even a third wave in, 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 in the market. So clearly, this is something we definitely need to keep a keen eye on. Rising unemployment, I've touched on that earlier. I think this is likely to be a... Um, issue going forward, a lot of us will be grappling with this. Now, I also mentioned that the time and pace of this virus is a very big concern for all of us because as um, China and, and as parts of the world start to um, re relax their lockdown mandates, the virus continues to be spreading at a very, very fast pace in other nations. And in fact, testing in many nations are still um, subpar. To, to if I can can find a better word. So as 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 the virus continues to affect different countries and different nations, 
and as other countries start to open up their, their economies, the supply and demand chain is not that easily linked up. And as such, this is going to be an, a very major issue for us to, to manage going forward. The third is the efficacy of monetary and, and I'll throw in fiscal policy that is, uh, we are seeing around the world. Yesterday in the uh, UK, they launched the first uh, negative interest uh, bond at, and raised some 3.86 um, pounds, I believe. Um, that, that's pre pretty shocking considering that you are actually paying the money money to the government for holding money for you for extended period of time. So this is something which I can't quite get my head around. At the same time, we're also witnessing huge amounting global debt. Um, I, I think this is uh, um, something which we can and will not be able to deal with right now, but future generations will be presented this in the silver plate and they will have to grab with how are they going to deal with this debt and how are they going to repay it. We also seeing rising com uh, protectionism. We saw this prior to the crisis for sure, uh, but we also saw it during the crisis where countries started to ban the export of some medical goods because their nation needed it uh, as well and they were not able or not um, permitting export of masks uh, and, and other uh, PPEs. So going forward post-COVID, I'm sure there will be rethinking on how some of this needs to be um, managed at a government level. Take, for example, uh, in the United States, um, I believe that the, the number stands at 80% of uh, pharmaceutical APIs are produced from China and India. That's huge. So I'm pretty sure that Homeland Securities will be thinking on how they can actually protect their pharmaceutical or their medical base. Last but not least, the US-China trade tension um, is now coming back in a very big way with a lot of finger pointing. But prior to the COVID-19, those things were the top of mind for many investors globally. And I, and I think that's going to haunt us for a long time as both US and China continue, continue to, to, to grapple for global uh, dominance and influence. And uh, as we s speak, um, China, or rather US, is really trying to get some Chinese companies that are um, non-compliant to be delisted from their, their exchange. So this is another thing for us to watch. Last but not least, what should you as an investor be thinking? How should you view this current situation? I think it'd be wise and you'd be very well advised to build portfolio resilience. You will need to be looking at good quality companies with very strong fundamentals, great corporate governance, strong cash flow, and probably dominance in the space that they occupy. Um, one should also keep some dry powder. Like I said, uh, we do not know how the intensity of this market correction. We do not know how far this is going to reach um, and the devastation is going to keep uh, making the market. But it does do well for investors to have dry powder should uh, another correction and a leg down happen. We think that the May lows, uh, the March lows is likely to be tested again. So we, we'll never know, hang on to those horses. Diversified because there is uh, diversification and compounding is only two free game in the investment world. So take advantage of that and find, be nimble. Okay, if the portfolio or an asset is not, uh, is causing you grief, get rid of it. Look for opportunities, look for better entry points. And last but not least, I'd like to share with you this Chinese word, Wei Ti. Um, techni technically, it's danger. But within danger, there also lies opportunity. I once said, the seeds of long-term investing, successful long-term investing, is sold during the periods of crisis. And today, we are facing one right now. So as an investor, you might want to consider this as an opportune time to participate in the market. So with that, um, I thank you for your kind attention. I certainly hope I've been able to answer some of the questions that, that you may have or address some of the issues that you're facing. And I'll be happy to take on uh, question and answers uh, later after the doctor has finished his section. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Abel, for your insight. So we had really some interesting questions for you during the question and answer session. So stay tuned. Now, uh, next we have Dr. Dung. So Dr. Dung has been a medical director of Care Plus since establishment of clinic. So he is a medical veteran with more than 20 years of experience in cardiovascular diseases. But he has been trained in the Department of Cardiovascular Imaging Diagnosis 
at the Chinese University of Hong Kong and Duke Cardiac MRI Center in the US. Now he is currently a lecturer uh, in the Department of Cardiovascular Diagnostic Imaging at the University of Medicine and Pharmacy in Ho Chi Minh City. So over to you, Dr. Deng. Thank you, Jason. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for inviting me to this uh, webinar. Okay, so uh, today I'd like to share uh, some information and tips about uh, being healthy physically and mentally during the uh, COVID. Okay, so I will start by a few essential information of uh, this virus that uh, you might already know. Um, this is the uh, very highly uh, transmissible virus. The way it spread is from from one person to other is through the droplets of um, of uh, respiratory uh, excrete, meaning when you cough, you sneeze, or even speak loud, uh, the virus is coming out from the respiratory of the infected uh, person and to the the other. The rate of uh, transmission is uh, estimated to be like. 10 times of the seasonal flu. And it, it is in the uh, top highest uh, group of uh, transmissible virus comparable to, to uh, missile. As any type of virus, uh, the COVID need to enter the human cell uh, to replicate and multiply. And in most of the case, it live in human in two to six weeks only. Then you see the fate of the virus is linked to the chance of transmission to other people. So if we can break that transmission, the virus stop multiplying and then get uh, eliminated. At the moment, uh, we, we, there is no uh, effective uh, medicine to, to kill this COVID virus. Uh, what you see around the world, the doctor is doing is just to give the support to the body and let the immune system of the patient fight and uh, eliminate the virus by themselves. And um, up to now, the scientific, scientists, uh, they estimate that the effective vaccine may come in about uh, 12 to 18 months time. And then you, we, we also have to consider that it would take uh, a few more months for the community to get enough immune in order to protect all of uh, the chance of the virus uh, get infected. Okay, so it's been like uh, four or five months since the COVID start, but still there's a lot of uh, things we don't know. They are very uncertain and uh, scientists and experts still have to uh, figure it out. But however, some data from studies show that uh, the majority of the cases might. Uh, bad consequence only happen in those who have high risk, like uh, which is already identified like on age, if uh, people have uh, cardiovascular disease, have high blood pressure, diabetes, I have uh, chronic uh, respiratory disease. One issue that people always uh, look at is the nature of uh, McLennan's nature of the, the COVID. Normally, uh, people uh, perceive as the number of dead. And then everybody wants to uh, compare between the COVID and other uh, virus, such as like flu when it comes to, to the uh, McLennan's uh, nature. But in fact, during the pandemic, until it's over, the comparison is very difficult because there are too many factors. We don't know uh, if it's uh, is a bias factor and, and, um, and, and can uh, affect, it's not just the nature of the virus. So I can give you an example here. You see, uh, in Singapore, the, there are only uh, four per one million case of uh, death. Uh, 
uh, is, is equal to uh, in reality 22 case uh, death case out of uh, nearly uh, 30,000 uh, confirmed positive case. But in Spain, that uh, ratio is uh, 594 death per 1 million. How come it is too uh, different? So it means that the, the death rate is is relating to the outbreak or the pandemic uh, situation. Okay, so uh, outbreak or the pandemic is the situation when too many people get infected at the same time and then healthcare system cannot handle. So the sick case cannot uh, reach to the hospital. Uh, the more severe case don't get uh, proper care. Uh, there is not enough uh, ICU bed available, and also lack of equipment and ventilator, you know, for to to serve for this severe case, and all of that to the increase in the number of uh, of that case. So the approach to prevent the surge of the death case in pandemic is to break the transmission. So here you see there are two scenarios. When a country, uh, if with the, the virus is, is in the community and untraceable, the only uh, measures to do is to uh, keep a social distance. So you look at the illustration, you understand the, the effectiveness of social distance to break the transmission. You see, in, in just in one case of F1, it can lead to a 32 case of uh, F6. So if you can limit the contact and be able to break one branch, then you already lower the number of uh, death by half, of infected case by half. So that's the, the principle, that's the theory of uh, social distance measure. In scenario two, like a uh, country like Vietnam or, or Korea, when the uh, pandemic is uh, under control, well, well controlled, then the approach is to try to identify the F1 case one by one and then do the uh, contract tracing and try to identify anyone who just have the uh, ability, have the possibility of getting infected and put them on isolate on quarantine in 14 days. So there's time safe to uh, the for the virus to to be eliminated. And then with that, there is no chance of the virus to uh, spread out in the community. Uh, back to Vietnam. Uh, here, the government has, and everybody is quite confident to say that the virus is not in the com community anymore. On the the, we don't have any new case in community in like uh, 35 days consecutively. Um, on the new reported case is citizen uh, return from abroad, and the country is still uh, keep restrict uh, on inbound uh, visitor and and flight. But understanding that the virus may come back once the border is open up then the government still recommend to be cautious and prudent. So government encourage people to avoid unnecessary gathering event, uh, always be alert and uh, responsible for uh, preventing uh, for even for other, especially if uh, anybody who has a respiratory symptom or have uh, close contact with somebody who they think is suspicious. Then that person need to uh, get confined. Don't come to the crowd. Don't come to the office. Stay home. Confine themselves, and then uh, report to the health authority. Uh, so it's clear. This is the fight. Then uh, you, you don't. We don't have any help from outside uh, with the COVID. Then uh, what should we do? What should we prepare for for such a situation? The answer is uh, we must rely on ourselves, on our strength. We must be uh, ready, hundred percent. You know, muscle, blood, skin.
skin, bone, the heart, the brain, everything must be 100% ready to fight. We must equip uh, the best available shield to protect from outside, but also we must build our muscle to be ready to fight from inside out. Protection from outside is all the recommendation from the, the Ministry of Health or from the government that you may already heard. Um, they are keep um, hand hygiene, wash hand as uh, frequent as possible. Uh, try to touch, try not to touch the, the hand to the face and uh, wearing masks in the crowd. They also recommend to uh, keep safe distance and avoid close contact with sick person. Uh, it, it can be any any respiratory symptom patient uh, people and we should uh, not uh, contact. And then stay home if have any uh, symptom. It is it's much important uh, to be strong from inside because that's the most uh, uh, protective way facing the any enemy. So as said previously, the fighting for of the uh, in the COVID game is your immune system. On the treatment you heard, that is you uh, admit to the hospital, oxygen, ventilation, ventilator, uh, drug, medicine, or even special procedure like uh, you may heard the ECMO. All of that are just uh, for, for supportive purposes, meaning it give your immune system time to fight uh, the virus. So if your immune system is strong, it will win the COVID by itself. So everybody must be aware of this and that, you know, you have to uh, invest on your health, have to have the good immune system. Uh, there are several uh, advice, effective tips that you uh, may, may know it. That is, you have enough sleep, you have the good quality sleep quality. And uh, you have to drink a lot of water. This is very simple, but people normally forgot. You know, you, you keep your, your body hydrate. That it is one simple factor to, uh, to increase your immune system. Okay, um, keep regular exercise, uh, be active. Uh, you limit the alcohol and cigarette as you know as much as possible. Is be healthy and avoid stress. Keep the uh, balanced life, and then also uh, be positive in your thinking. So one good thing I I see uh, in in people, especially the Vietnamese during the COVID, is they are. Uh, much more aware of the, the importance of the good health. So uh, in order to, to have good health, see you, you have to invest on that because health is the uh, depreciate asset, right? Uh, you overuse it, you don't care about it, uh, you don't uh, nourish it. Then once it needs, it's not there for you to use. Very simple, uh, do the health checkup if not yet done. And this help you to have the, the uh, baseline. If any health issue uh, found, then uh, we can fix it uh, as early as it happened. And then the doctor and yourself will plan, we have a plan for a better health and then you execute it and do all the uh, follow up for, for, for that purpose. The, my other advice, which is also very important, is vaccination. So you all know that influenza and pneumonia vaccine does not work for COVID itself, okay? But it can protect yourself from having a flu or a pneumonia, which is always a decompensation of your immune system. So once you have flu, your immune system is uh, weakened and then is more vulnerable to get infected by uh, COVID or any other uh, virus outside. So that's why you have to 
prevented the you know, upfront uh, not to get the, not to get any flu attack or any uh, pneumonia. Okay. Uh, so this is also a an, an very important uh, tips to to have the good health. So this is um, also a very um, important reminder because um, for those who have high risk, so uh, we we you more likely uh, the bad consequences happen. So that's why we need to be even more. Um, aware of uh, keeping on this uh, underlying disease under well control okay um and even for those people the the vaccine is vaccination is is more important so be aware of that those who have older than 60 have cardio disease or respiratory disease blood pressure diabetes should be uh, see the doctor more frequent and then keep everything under control now, this is an um, important part of the health that is vulnerable during the pandemic. This is our mental health. So, with COVID uh, outbreak, there are too many unexpected bad news coming every day that uh, exceed the capacity of one person to digest. So, normally you will switch to the crisis mode. You feel concerned, worry about yourself or family member uh, so mm, especially when a lot of things uh, we don't know still don't know uh, you you uh, all the scientists expert everybody in the world still uh, share a lot of information that uh, the conclusion is we don't know we don't know why and also a lot of conspiracy theory that you know uh, keep our mind very messy and the life change during the lockdown and social distance you have to work from home with the kid around last but not least the financial and income and job uh, related issue okay here i i uh, uh, share with you uh, uh, a little bit about the uh, psychology step when everybody are uh, facing a crisis Right. It will be like uh, five step. So first, you will uh, reject it. You don't think it's real. It cannot be true. Uh, cannot be a, a, a McLean that McLean virus. Okay. Then next, the the normal uh, psychology uh, reaction is you you feel anger. You feel how come it happened? How come? Who's to blame? And then after that you you realize that uh, it's there the virus is there the uh, sickness and the death number everything is there it happened then you feel depressed you feel like uh, it's it's very uh, desperate situation uh, nothing can help I get the virus on the negative on the on the bad on the worst uh, consequence will happen and then after that you try to pray for some helper to come like vaccine you you any news you hear from uh, vaccine coming out you hope that it can come earlier but then finally you will come to the stage when you realize that there is no perfection in this world now that's the nature of life and you have to live with this and you have to live your best with the crisis okay um so as doctor i've seen a surge of patient coming to me uh, because they think they are sick or uh, their chronic uh, disease um is um is is worsen so eventually after checking everything is fine it's just due to the psychologic stress so this symptom of stress is quite uh, diverse. Uh, some are quite uh, common, like you feeling tense, you feel fear, anxious. You may feel even the pain in the chest or the palpitation, or you may feel like uh, it's difficult to breathe. It affects your your sleep quality and the the uh, focus, the concentration also. 
some change the uh, eating pattern. And uh, also you, a lot is uh, showing the behavior of uh, obsess with on the protection. You see, people try to buy the by the best mask, try to, you know, equip with on the uh, sterilized home device, the uh, ultraviolet light, you know, try to, to get the best protection uh, at home. And the other, but very common uh, characteristic behavior we observe in this patient is they get uh, addicted to the bad news in social media. You know, they frequently uh, check on Facebook, you know, try to get update the latest bad news. Somehow, this satisfies them in short term. But those news cause more fear and anger and anxiety. And it's a vicious circle. It's like a habit you are unable to break. So, the more they are plugging in the social media, the more stressful they are. So, in fact, uh, you don't get accurate information from social media. During COVID, the medical expert around the world all claim the bad consequence of the misinformation. Uh, this, I think you already, uh, you also heard about. So then a typical example in Vietnam is uh, there's a case in the north of Vietnam. They, uh, he himself uh, take uh, several pills of uh, hydroxychloroquine. Uh, because he think that, and he read from the Facebook that uh, it can help him to prevent the COVID. But that later he got uh, intoxication, has to admit to the ICU, has to do a lot of um, important procedure uh, to treat. So misinformation is evil, like the virus itself. Because the, the news in uh, Facebook, uh, in social media is uh, redundant and fast. So it comes to people as frequent and people tend to think that it is all accurate. So as doctor, we ourselves fight the virus in one hand and also have to fight the misinformation war too. You know, so my advice is just look at, look for the, um, the, the creditable uh, source of information. You just look for the trustful source, like uh, from WHO, from CDC, or from government. You, you can also, you know, ask and check your check with doctor, okay? Uh, because they, they are the one who know uh, which source is um, the, the trustful and uh, credential and try to avoid all the uncredential source of uh, information. So, uh, what should we do to, to get our uh, mental well-being? Uh, first, understand that it's very normal that you feel anxious and you feel sad during the pandemic time, nothing wrong about it. Okay, just, we just need to have a plan. And that plan will start by first stay away from social media and Facebook. Uh, to unplug from that, okay, and specifically stay away from the source of bad news that cause your fear and anger. Just take a break, okay. Uh, you should spend more time with the thing that make you uh, happy and calm, okay. Uh, you uh, take care of your body. You know, uh, you try to have good sleep. You know, drink, be active. You can do on the uh, deep breath, stretch, all the thing that can help you to uh, relax and feel calm. Spend the time to do the thing that make you happy and calm. And very important, uh, keep connected with uh, friends and family, for those who you you love and you trust. Uh, share your feeling, and you can talk, discuss with them. They, those uh, friends, families, those you love can uh, transmit to you the positive energy to cope with this uh, crisis. And finally, think positive, very important. If uh, nothing you can do, then it's no good to be pessimistic and negative. 
just keep thinking positive. Uh, one example is if you are you think you're healthy and you you think that uh, even if you get infected by the COVID, you can win it. Even if it becomes worse, you still can win it because with the help of on other measure, your immune system have time to to uh, to fight and then win the game uh, at the at the uh, uh, at the end. So with that, I want to close my uh, talk here and uh, thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer any question. Right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Deng, for all your advice. Three things that really stood out from your presentation. I think number one is about the complications right, in view of COVID-19 and getting vaccinated against other viruses is important. So this is something that's very important advice. Another thing is about the, the, the flooding of information that's online and some are really misinformation. So our viewers must be discerning against uh, this information. So now we have come to the question and answer session, and we really have quite a number of questions. So now the first question goes out to Abel. So now we know about the love-hate relationship between, you know, about cash during the pandemic. So under low interest rate environment, which we have mentioned during your, pre your presentation, and it's likely to persist, would you encourage investors to keep cash? Uh, well, this is actually, uh, um, um, can you guys hear me? Okay, this is actually a really, really good question, and uh, it's also an extremely difficult uh, question to answer at this current juncture because the long tail of this COVID nineteen, um, no one really knows the impact and, and how much devastation is likely to leave on the market in its trail. Um, I will attempt to answer this on on using two two two, two levels. I think um, rates are definitely going to stay uh, low for a lot longer. Um, I think we're going to expect this for the next few years, uh, to be exact. Um, to answer this in, in two, 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 two levels is take it as a short-term view, taking a short-term view, I think one should not be looking to, to, um, to rush into the markets per se, because ultimately, if I remember correctly, the current, uh, the, the COVID-19 is disinflationary in nature, i.e. there's very little inflation uh, pressure on markets, but at the same time, uh, on the Vietnamese side, um, the deposit rate is actually rather attractive. So you have positive carry. So in the short term, it might actually be very useful for you to hold on to cash uh, or like what I mentioned earlier, dry powder, in the sense that as market continues to evolve and if there's any gap down in the near future, one can actually take advantage of these uh, opportunities to position um, quality assets in their portfolio um, so in the longer run, you will want to have that dry powder available to you. So, so like you rightly pointed out, uh, it's a love-hate relationship, but I guess in the near term, um, it's actually quite beneficial to, to, to hold on to cash at this current juncture. All right, thank you, Abel. Now, keeping cash is to make sure that you have the right resources to invest in the right you know, assets when available. So the next thing is about volatility, right? We have seen extreme volatility during this period when we look at stock indices, the commodities indices, for example. So would you advise investors to now be, you know, take more exposure to these assets or should they take a long-term view right, to escape the safe haven? What's your view on this? Um, good question again. Okay. See, every individual, there's no cookie cutter answer to, to, to this. Um, every, every individual has got different time horizon, investment objectives, and, and um, ability to invest. So the ability to invest, for example, um, will vary from you and me. Um, and what decides or presides over this is clearly um, my ability to sleep well, or to, to me, the, the sleep well index, whereby if I made an investment decision, uh, how well will I sleep? Um, in view of uh, combating uh, COVID. And at the same time, does it meet longer term goals? In fact, in UOB, we've actually done a study a um, number of years back, and we found that there are two extremes in, in, in the investor market. There are investors who either take on too much risk in view of the uh, investment goals, or investors who take too little risk to, to hit the investment goals. Um, in other words, we have people who are taking on high risk uh, tactical um, in their portfolio when their retirement goal is doesn't quite require that at level of risk. But similarly, on um, the other side of the coin, people have got huge uh, um, um, objectives they want to achieve, but they're only willing to hold 
to fixed deposit. So that kind of risk doesn't quite gel. So get, going back to that question, I think volatility um, is the the only way for investors to make uh, money in the market. Because if, if markets went on a straight line, there's really no opportunity for you um, to, to, to participate uh, and, and generate alpha. But at the end of the day, with volatility and you are able to embrace your risk uh, correctly, um, this current market situation might actually work very well for you um, in, in the longer term. I think I, I mentioned it earlier, the seed of long-term investing, successful long-term investing, which actually sold during crisis period like such. Okay, thanks, Abel. The next question is actually a combination of questions from the audience. So let me put them together into one. So um, I think the audience is very interested about the ongoing, you know, US and China trade tensions, right? As you had mentioned also in your presentation. Now we have uh, spliced it up with the COVID-19 pandemic that's going to complicate matters, right? Likelihood in the long term. So it, arising from this situation, right? What do you think uh, is the outlook for the ASEAN region? You know, Vietnam is now sitting right in the center of ASEAN. How is this going to impact Vietnam and ASEAN in general? Another very good question. Um, unfortunately, when uh, un unfortunately, when elephants fight, uh, the grass around it get trampled. Uh, so so um, there's no real outright winner. At the infancy of a uh, fight between the two largest economies in the world, um, clearly, US and China wants to dominate um, particular spaces um, in, in, in the industry and in the market, and they want uh, to be able to control that piece, um, some possibly for servant sake, some possibly for profitability. But at the end of the day, I think, um, uh, in fact, we had this question during a, a, a conversation we had in the Singapore Forum. Uh, at the end of the day, um, globalization is being challenged as we speak. Um, I, I presented the case of a potential re regionalization of uh, markets, i.e. you will see more and more countries forming PACs, i.e. take for example the TPP, you know, um, and a lot of Asian countries and uh, economies are already involved in this and this might actually carve up the world into different trading blocks. Um, so, so that will create opportunity at the same time, um, tremendous amount of risk. Why do I say that? People seem to think that uh, migration of industries and companies um, is a simple thing of unplugging and moving to a different country, replugging, and then starting all over again. Unfortunately, it's not. Um, and I'll give you uh, some examples. Think, think of infrastructure, think of logistics, for example. Um, it is not homogeneous across all the Asian countries. Um, certain countries has got better infrastructures, um, better, better uh, highways, uh, railways, uh, uh, abilities, but at the same time, um, logistics. And at the same time, you want to consider regulatory, some uh, some regulations and, and policies uh, in, in the specific countries may impede companies from moving from country to countries. And of course, you will want to consider um, the buildings, you know, building a premise to house a company. It's, it's not so easy. Um, I've also heard many people arguing that uh, Vietnam is like the obvious um, destination from China. Um, I, I, I actually have um, second thoughts on, on that. Um, I, I think it's it's more about the, the capacity issue that, that uh, Vietnam is facing. I th and I, uh, obviously, you guys are experts over there, so I, I, I correct me if I'm wrong, but I think right now Vietnam is growing at a pace where it's actually um, bursting as it seems. If you look at the roads, the congestion that you experience every day, I, I think that is an indicator of how how robust the economy has been. Now, if you, a company is thinking about moving their businesses uh, from China uh, uh, to Vietnam, I think capacity is going to be uh, a major issue because number one, infrastructure-wise, I think uh, China is actually quite far ahead. And um, by an analogy, if you if you think about um, Vietnam, like uh, like Guangzhou, um, uh, one of the manufacturing hub in in China, the population size is about the same. Uh, Guangzhou has about one hundred and three million uh, workers, but the difference here is that Guangzhou has the ability to attract immigrant workers. They can attract workers from other states coming into Guangzhou, i.e., they can actually grow capacity and productivity. Um, Vietnam, on the other hand, with ninety seven million um, uh, citizens. It's quite hard for you to for 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 them, Vietnam to attract that that uh, immigrant workers. So 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 in terms of capacity, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of logistics, I think there are a lot of challenges for 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 a country like Vietnam. 
Um, instead, I think countries like Malaysia and Indonesia, which actually can replace China in terms of uh, machineries and uh, automatic manufacturing parts, I think they, these countries uh, may may um, may benefit because they, they, they already have a mature industry in that front. Uh, unfortunately, countries like Singapore, uh, I think we are going to be um, quite badly impacted, like it or not. Um, ultimately, Singapore has got a very open economy and we are number two in the world in terms of relying on the global supply chain um, for our economy. So so I think countries like Singapore, uh, we have uh, our work cut out for us to be exact. All right, thank you, Abel, for a very comprehensive answer to this question. I think the next question will go out to Dr. Dung. So, Dr. Dung, we have heard about cases of uh, re-positive for COVID-19. So, is that a concern? And what kind of safeguards can we put in place, right, uh, uh, to protect ourselves and loved ones? Okay. Um, so, like I said in the during the presentation. There's a lot of uh, things, uncertainty that uh, we don't know about this virus. And one of this is the, the repositive, uh, the, I mean, the impact, the, the real impact of the repositive cases. At the moment, uh, on what the observation uh, we see in the world is on the repositive cases is uh, likely to be. Uh, uh, on laboratory level, not on the uh, clinical level, meaning when you do the test, it can be, uh, you know, go up to the level that you can detect the virus. Uh, you can detect some part of the virus in, in the body, but that level doesn't translate to the uh, causing consequence in the body, meaning that that person is an uh, unlikely to to get you know like a new infected and then by that it is also uh, less likely to get uh, spread it out infected out to to other so we hope that the repositive case is uh, not really a, a real life and clinical uh, consequence it's just you know because we check on the blood we see the the virus is still there, uh, you know, but in the level that under control and then don't give any consequence. So when it comes to the what, what should we do to protect ourselves? Uh, even and, and especially for those who work in the office or for those who, you know, normally have to meet a lot of client customer, you cannot um, avoid the, the social socializing. Uh, we we receive that uh, question uh, very frequent and then uh, the thing is that that question is always put on the perfection term you you want to have a um, you know answer that can give you the uh, ability to do you know just just have the uh, perfection in in real life this is not uh, you you cannot you know perfectly completely prevent all the chance of uh, you know getting infected so the best way the most uh, uh, reasonable way to prevent is like i say have to invest on your health have to be strong inside right so you you have a good health have a good immune system then you already increase the chance to uh, fight and win if the virus is uh, get infected, and then second is to to do on the measure uh, to protect you from outside, uh, which the the health authority now is advised. Uh, in office for office worker, I think uh, you you will try to uh, do just just practice safe, uh, meaning. Everybody has to be alert. Everybody has to be aware that if they themselves get respiratory symptom or get sick, they should should not come to the office. Okay, just stay home. You know, report. If they uh, by accident uh, have close contact with anybody, but they also think it's uh, suspicious, like somebody who come uh, you know from abroad, they also have to uh, stay home and and uh, report it. 
and inside the office, like I say, if everybody is just in this community, don't don't have the contact with people outside, it's safe because in Vietnam, the virus is unlikely to to be in the uh, community, so it's clean in the in the community until the border is open up. We we will see by that time what is the measure, what is the recommendation of the government, what is their level of uh, confidence to open up, and then, then by that we know. At the moment, we don't know. At the moment, what what I can say is, is safe. Uh, if you just contact with people in in the community in Vietnam, there is no virus inside, and then have the safe. Mask is also one thing you can do, okay? Uh, don't need to be uh, too obsessed with mask uh, because, um, of course, it will prevent you, you know, somehow with on the uh, communicating with socializing. Uh, but uh, you wear a layer of mask is better than than you don't. In order to uh, from from the perspective of preventing uh, the virus. So, so really, you know, in, in a world where there's unknown and unknown, so the best formula is to be socially responsible to yourself and the people around you, be it office or family. So thank you for the advice. We are running out of time, but we have one last question for Dr. Gun. So we, we always believe that we need to learn by example. So Vietnam just emerged from social distancing not too long ago. I've been through that. So it's very to hear from Dr. De, what did you do, you know, to, to keep yourself mentally and physically active, you know, during the social distancing period? Can you share with our audience? Thank you. So, uh, first, I, I uh, just don't go to, to any uh, Facebook and any, you know, bad news source. Whenever I see that, I just, you know, next, hit the next button. Uh, I, I don't, I don't, I uh, proactively try not to get, you know, distract from this kind of information. Okay. And I think that is very important because, uh, you know, you, you share on that uh, negative uh, news, then it's like virus is spread out and even your relative, your family member may, may read it and then it will increase the, the level of, um, negativity in, in the uh, social. I still try to keep on the uh, exercise habit. I do myself, I do uh, riding bicycle. And like during the time when the, the, the city in the country is, um, is uh, locked down, I do it like every uh, two, three days. 40 kilometer every every two three day i just wear the mask and then can, can i can ride myself outside okay and then um, keep close with with your friend relative you know you can you can just call them don't or you know you uh, uh, set up a group uh, in 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 like facebook in the social media but just a, a group a private group where you can you know uh, do on the on the uh, chit chat on the activity and then share on the uh, on the experience that they are having. You know, if they are do cooking, and we can even uh, you know set up an like an online drinking uh, with too many people. Right? It's it's also uh, fun because we cannot uh, meet everybody by that time. And then I think uh, at, uh, last is try to stay positive. Try to think uh, very positive that uh, if you're healthy, you are less likely to get infected. Okay, and even if you get infected, it is less likely that you get severe consequence. And then, if even if you get severe consequence, you are healthy, then it is more likely you win the game at the end. You don't need to just look at all the uh, number and on the uh, negative uh, example, like the case can happen in the young, the case can happen in everybody and in the asymptomatic case. It is just rare, it's not the majority. The majority is still 80% of the case is mine. 
majority is still the uh, fatality uh, rate is just about you know one percent two percent so it, it doesn't mean that if you get it then you will you will die no don't don't think on on the uh, side just look at the bright side yeah. so really, really interesting perspective from dr De. so the spread of negative news is more detrimental than the virus itself <laughs> So there's something that we will, we will keep in mind. Uh, thank you for all the questions posted by the uh, attendees. We will get back to you uh, shortly uh, through email separately. So we have come to the end of the webinar and on behalf of Singapore Business Group and our co-hosts, I would like to thank all our speakers, Mr. Abel Lim from UOB, Dr. Deng from Care Plus Clinic, and special mention to our platinum sponsor, Capital Land, our diamond sponsor, UOB and Visip, our silver sponsors, KPMG, Minor Hotels, Fumi Bar, Specialized Industrial Parks, Hammock Hotel. So a big shout out to all the webinar attendees also. So today, um, you are important and your views, we will get back to you on all your queries and do give us your feedback after the webinar and we will stay in touch with you. Um, have a great weekend ahead and thank you everyone.